Hi, everyone. Welcome to Inside Policy Talks, the McDonald Laurie Institute's in house podcast. I'm Aaron Woodrick, the director of MLI's domestic policy program, and very pleased to be joined today by Michael Jackson Bonner, who's a political advisor, historian, and author of a great new book that we're going to be talking about today entitled In Defense of Civilization. Michael, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for inviting me. So, I mean, the obvious thing I have to ask at the top anytime I have uh, someone on who has written a book is uh, why why this book, so maybe first describe what the book is about, and then we get into why you decided to write it. Good question. So <clears throat> the book the book is called In Defense of Civilization. It's, it's the defense of civilization as a, as a concept, uh, as, a, as a value. It's not about, uh, you know, it's not, it's not literally about uh, weapons and walls and fighting or anything like that. Uh, it's uh, trying to recover a clearer sense of a concept that we have, I think, lost in the West or that has been somewhat much degraded and not necessarily only in the West, but um, it's mainly for, a, you know, a, a Western audience. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the impetus came at the height of COVID in 2020. And I thought it was sort of worthwhile looking into this concept, this idea as to like what makes us civilized what what civilization actually is and um you know what we can do and what has been done in the past mm -hmm. to keep it alive and to uh to renew it now apart from that i also i mean i think a lot of people in in our part of the world uh they realize that something is wrong um they may not exactly be able to describe what it is or how it happened or why expectations at the end of the 20th century have sort of not been uh, met uh, in the early 21st. And I wanted to provide some sort of framework for discussing that. Very interesting. And so you said this struck during COVID, like, was it just you had a little more time on your hands to contemplate <laughs> this? Or was there is there something beyond that? Well, I when when I was, uh, when I was taking the the, the king's shilling, or I guess at that time, the queen's shilling, uh, working for the Ontario government, I would never have dreamed of <laughs> doing any uh, private research or certainly sure. certainly not working on a book uh, during those days. But uh, I, uh, you know, I felt that uh, um, that that was the, that was sort of the occasion to reflect on, um, you know, when we were all sort of cooped up inside with uh, sure. very little to do, you know, what it actually meant to you know what what because we talked a lot about trying to um save lives keep uh keep society going um you know make sacrifices for something or other but the question was sacrifices for what mm -hmm. what is it that we are when we come out of this what is it that we hope to have uh preserved um yeah. and <clears throat> that was a uh, you know, that was an angle, I think, that was really not part of any kind of public policy discussion. Uh, and, <clears throat> you know, the world is slightly different now than, than it was uh, before the pandemic. But this is a question that we still need to ask. You know, what, it is, what is it that we are working to um, uh, prolong, preserve and, 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 and pass down to, uh, you know, to the future? Now, I mean, a lot of people will be familiar with the cliche of, uh, you know, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. But it sounds to me here like this is more than just about not knowing history, right? If people don't know what had happened before, um, they're not able to sort of leverage that that knowledge learned from past mistakes. But when you talk about civilization, I think there's more to it than just not knowing facts about things that happened in the past. Mm -hmm. So um, what is it that you think, in, I mean, you mentioned the moment that we're in today, you know, late 20th, early, early 21st century, um, where there's this sense of um, um, malaise in society. A lot of people have a very pessimistic view. What is it that you think we've lost? What do you think that, what, what has changed that has, has led to this sort of widespread feeling that I think you put it accurately, a lot of people feel, but don't quite have the words to describe it or or, or uh, have a cohesive explanation for why why the world is the way it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the <clears throat> anthropologically, the impetus for settling down and living in one place and building permanent uh, dwellings and things like that that gave us what we call civilization, that comes ultimately from 
a, a particular view of history, which you alluded to, which is the idea that people have a place in history. They have a shared past. They have, um, you know, this is, this idea is often embodied in, um, ancestor is kind of like cult of ancestors or, mm -hmm. uh, ancestor worship, which survives in some parts of the world. Um, but it's, however, however we choose to embody that sense of history and connection with, uh, the past that, that that's it, that we, we, we don't, you know, we don't all have to go out and become professional historians or memorize dates, but ultimately the idea that people have a kind of continuum, people live in a continuum uh of of uh ancestors uh the present and then the future it's uh, it's really that idea that that has been significantly degraded and of course mm. you know i managed to write an entire book without ever mentioning edmund burke but uh, which some people probably find surprising but that is a obviously a burkean idea that he didn't invent it this is yeah. just something that everybody or <clears throat> practically everybody since you know the 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 uh, uh, early Stone Age uh, have taken for granted that this is this is the right sort of orientation of uh, mankind in place and time. What's new is this idea that the past doesn't matter, mm -hmm. and that, um, the the uh, the sense that there's a kind of moral, technological, and social progress that just sort of grinds away dissolves ties to the past makes the past irrelevant uh and and persuades people to view it as uh if not actually if not if not irrelevant then actually as evil this sort of separates people from um that continuum and it makes it i would argue hard perhaps impossible to be civilized and if you think about a time when this connection was totally severed, say, after the fall of the the Western Roman Empire, or you know the collapse of uh, uh, the Bronze Age. You know, things do recover, but mm. they take a long time in many cases. And that period during which the connection is lost is is really pretty rough. And um, I don't think it's worth. I don't, it's it's not even worth contemplating going through that sort of thing again. So the book sort of urges us to you know think a little bit differently about about that um, modern perspective now i guess i'd have to ask because uh you you paint in some cases a pretty a dreary picture a pretty bleak picture of the state of affairs do you consider your book to be a a pessimistic uh a, a, a pessimistic book like or are you optimistic about uh you know where we can go from here well <clears throat> i'm pessimistic in the sense that um I think that with a long enough time scale, decline and collapse are inevitable. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's something. And that's the trajectory we're on now. Uh, potential. I mean, yes, yes, we we are all uh, as as uh, frail uh, creatures. We are we are always on this trajectory at one at one point or another. Uh, but I'm optimistic in the same way that. Um, uh, you know, in in the in the same way that the uh, say uh, if you if you think about Norse mythology or something that the collapse is never the, the end of the world is never actually totally the end that there's always a regrowth that comes and you can sort of look forward to this eventual uh, you know uh, re uh, uh, the eventual return of of of, of civilization. Um, I, I wouldn't say that, you know, I'm not going to say that we're necessarily uh, facing imminent doom, but we are always on that uh, trajectory toward collapse and we can delay it or we can hasten it. Mm -hmm. And if we decide that we don't want to preserve our, our culture, our technology, our um, social order and so forth, and it you know, and, and we sort of allow these things to decay, they won't necessarily collapse instantly. They will float downstream for a long time. And it's only when people begin to realize that it's arguably too late. And this, as I say, this has happened many times in the past and it could happen again now. What's worrisome is 
in the sort of optimism of the end of the 20th century and especially after the um end of the cold war mm -hmm. it seems like everybody just decided you know everything was great we can all go to sleep now um well it was the end of history so there's nothing more exactly. to do apparently exactly so if so F F fukuyama can be interpreted sort of as a uh, a contemporary uh, prophet like figure who many people thought was trying to tell us that you know there was nothing further for us to do we can just sort of uh go to sleep and the the um uh, the liberal millennium uh was upon us and it would just be sort of smooth sailing i, I and i think we can <laughs> clearly <laughs> clearly see and of course that isn't exactly what he said but that's yes. what people thought he meant and yes. I think that we can clearly see that that has not um, uh, that has not worked out. Yeah, I, I want to. I know. I know your book is uh, is very broad. It encompasses uh, you know world history, and it's it's really geared towards a Western audience generally. But I wanted to talk. We we're both Canadians. Uh, you know, Canada is a country that's relatively young. We have relatively little history, and I think it's fair to say most Canadians are unfamiliar with it uh, to, to most degrees. Um, I'm wondering if, if, from your perspective as a Canadian, are there any lessons in particular Canada can draw, either from its own history or from world history? And is 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 Canada sort of at the mercy of the broader trends in the West? Or is there anything that, you know, any sort of particular strengths or weaknesses we have as a country that would allow us to sort of break out of this malaise, uh, regardless of what our peers do? Yeah, well, I think that we're, like other English-speaking countries, I think we're always going to be drawn or sort of attracted by the uh, gravitational pull of the, the United States. And mm -hmm. since we're right next to them, you know, it's going to be much harder for us to, to escape it. And of course there, um, the sort of, the, the grist mill of, of uh, liberalism sort of has sort of churned away and, and worn down the, the, uh, the 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 inherited culture that that was received from abroad, um, to say nothing of what has happened to um, Aboriginal populations in mm -hmm. in North America, which is clearly much worse, um, and something similar has happened here. I think that what makes the situation in Canada more troubling is that we have an entire class of people who. A, 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 an elite class, a governing class, who seem to really believe that the way out of humanity's problems is to forget history and that being sort of uh, divorced from it is to be free of a kind of burden and that it makes um, interaction with others and um, economic mm. uh, prosperity uh, easier and better now i i would urge everybody to really reconsider that mm -hmm. because the the actual outcome of that kind of mode of thought being deprived of a knowledge of history even recent history you know we saw it um in the house of commons in which um i'm not going to get his name right but the uh, the member of the waffen ss who was invited to now without parsing out the details of that i mean that's clearly a, a failure of historical memory which mm -hmm. is not even really historical i mean this the it's events, within our lifetime exactly uh, the the you know uh, both my grandfathers were in that war and as far as i was concerned growing up it was a current event mm -hmm. um now it isn't now it, it seems to be a distant uh memory and and if 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 the second world war is a distant sort of muddled memory i mean what what would anybody have to say about the founding of our of our country or mm -hmm. the you know the um uh voyages of uh of uh you know john cabot and 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 company you know, the, it must be so dimly remembered if it's remembered at all um so i i i really think that that uh, that this is indicative of a problem yeah and uh it isn't the solution to anything i mean the, the, sorry the forgetfulness isn't a solution to anything sure it makes people um it makes people uh sort of 
morally and socially uh, less competent, it means that people are more likely to sort of lose touch with any kind of sense of of communal life or sort of common common life or a sense of common good. And the failure of historical memory has been responsible in, say, the Soviet Union or in Nazi Germany for all kinds of, or China, for instance, under Mao, uh, has been responsible for all kinds of horrific uh, disasters. If you feel yourself rooted in, in a community or tied to others because of ancestral uh, ancestral relationships or, or a kind of debt to the, to the past, you are less likely to fall for, uh, tyrannical schemes or, or, or to feel sort of lost in a, in, a in a sort of social wilderness without, without customs or, or, or sort of shared values and so mm. forth. Um, this obviously, uh, you know, there's an obvious conflict, I think, between our doctrine of multiculturalism and the idea of uh, uh, shared um, norms, I guess. Sure. But I don't. I mean, I just, I don't, I don't really see how that's any different from sort of any other time or place in in history. If you think of, say, um, uh, you know, uh, early medieval Britain after the fall of the Romans, you know, you have multiple languages being talked. There are all kinds of different people from all over the place. Um, the, the imperial government is gone. It's sort of near anarchy, constant uh, uh, tribal and other, other forms of feuding. And, and, you know, after a certain point, the idea had to be developed that there was something that all everyone there had in common yeah it was shared it was a shared sort of uh, uh you know kelto germanic roman uh past which sort of all eventually blended into something that could be called uh british and it was um you know historians and and others who helped um make that happen now obviously we haven't been around in this country for enough time but that's not a really good enough excuse to sure. sort of fail to find some way of working wor you know working together uh, and 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 sort of uh you know uh, forging a, a common uh, common identity norms and so forth but yeah. will, ultimately the lesson is that it will ultimately come from from history not from right. not from not, not not because say pierre trudeau you know Sure. Gave us a document. A government diktat. Yeah. yeah. Well, also, it's interesting. So, I mean, you're making the point that, um, you know, the existence of diversity today is not necessarily a barrier to forging a common identity at some point down the road, but you clearly need to value the idea of having an identity. And I think it's fair to say in Canada, I mean, we have a prime minister that once said that Canada has no core identity. I think Canada has been described by some unflatteringly as like the world's biggest train station where people pass <laughs> through. Yeah. And uh, even when it comes to in our willingness to remember our history, I mean, you've, you, we've always seen a lot of attempts in Canada to cancel, you know, our first prime minister, Sir Johnny MacDonald. I, I don't think anyone would imagine that happening in the United States. So perhaps is it fair to say that in Canada, as compared to, say, the United States, while there may be those in America that would prefer to um, erase parts of its history, they have more vocal defenders of it, whereas in Canada... There are fewer people willing to sort of stand up and say, well, you know, there are actually important yeah. things that we want to defend and remember about our history. Yeah, I mean, America is a land of extremes, so you will have extreme defenders and you will have, ex you know, extreme uh, uh, iconoclasts or whatever. Uh, in Canada, you know, it's we've we've always been, I think, frustrated by the 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 difficulty of finding common figures between you know when i was a boy the question was always you know sort of like french canada or mm -hmm. english canada and you know if you grew up in montreal maybe you would have a different perspective but um uh, you know even even the, the the there were even questions about how old the country actually was or who was here first and when and so forth but i mean that that kind of thing is still um uh you know that's okay i mean having having those discussions or feuds or whatever as long as they're civil i think is is perfectly all right um but you're right i mean 
uh, the the ironic thing is when when you think about say the the uh, the fight over Egerton Ryerson or something. Yeah. Like I I I don't think anyone had ever even heard of Egerton Ryerson before that. Yeah. So yeah. so there was no one to defend him. Right. Right. And and the the uh, statue haters uh, and name haters, whatever, they found a reason to, you know, they, they found an easy target. Same thing for Dundas. I mean, even I, I don't really know that much about Dundas. I don't know. Like, I don't know what we would all get out of renaming a huge street that goes on forever. And there, and there are Dundas streets all over the place. Um, but, uh, you know, it would... It, we probably wouldn't be in this position if we had known, uh, you know, if, if as a society we had known more about these things uh, to begin with. Um, but ultimately, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm equally sort of worried that I sense that the other side doesn't really care. That it is, e even if we could have every doctoral student writing essays all day, every day on um whatever his name is henry dundas i think it's henry um you know elucidating the the truth about him i, I don't think it would make any difference because mm -hmm. they don't they, they seem they seem not to care hmm. very troubling um i want to talk i uh, we've got time for one more question i, I wanted to touch on the special case uh, that you mentioned in your book of china um, and I, I think this relates to what we started off on the top talking about you know this idea that you know, individuals find value, comfort in in a, in, a, in a shared identity, in a sense of timelessness, whether it's a connection to the past, whether that's a belief in in religion and the supernatural. So more than just this, um, what we might call sort of hyper individualized atomization that we see in the West today. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we could talk a little bit about China and how China, um, obviously, you know, the sort of the sort of rival power and worldview right now, and how. Um, they have a very different view of uh, things like individualism, and some argue that's kind of one of the central differences between the West and China right now. So, um, you know, what what uh, what do you see in China? Are there things the West can learn from China, and and uh, maybe talk a little bit about um, the the danger that China poses to the West as well? Yeah, so I I do think that there are lessons from China, and not all of them are good, mm. but. Um, you know, the, I think that the that there is a huge. Put it this way: when 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 the Roman Empire collapsed in the West, that that had been the only political order that anybody had ever known or heard of for a very very long time. And then you have these sort of sub-Roman, um, so-called barbarian kingdoms that crop up, and then gradually they evolve into um, the medieval uh, kingdoms that we know, and then eventually. Uh, national states and or well i guess they're, they're empires and national states mm -hmm. um china has a very different history where there was only ever one there were many dynasties but there was only one chinese empire and it was unified uh under the Qin. and ever since then there's been an effort to repeat that same sort of unification with roughly the same kind of territory although it, it did expand and contract over time and um, if you said to someone in the European Union, you know, like, let's restart the Roman Empire, it wouldn't fly. But yeah. that's, that, that is somewhat a different, it's not exactly the, the same as recreating the Qin Empire, but it's pretty close mm -hmm. uh, in China. Uh, and it has, it's been going through sort of cycles of that for a very, very long time. Um, the main ideological force there, not the only one, but the main one was Confucianism. And Confucius himself is looking back to an earlier time before the unification of China when he thought that um, gentlemanly conduct prevailed and that uh, there was a kind of uh, uh, civilized attitude and rituals were carried out well and music was properly performed and so on and so on. Um, we don't really have a figure like that in the mm -hmm. in the West, but we do have uh, we do have our own um, uh, religious uh, and political traditions, of course. Um, the thing is, though, that Confucianism was able to sort of absorb China's many invaders, 
and they often became very enthusiastic um, <clears throat> uh, Conf Confucianists and d defenders of of Chinese civilization um, in the same way that the Germanic barbarians e e adopted sort of Roman style uh, court uh, etiquette and they wrote in Latin and, and things like that. And, you know, Latin continued to be used for a very long time. Um, this all sort of held good until the Chinese empire collapsed in, in 1910. And the uh, under Mao and the, the Cultural Revolution, the order of the day was basically to destroy Confucianism mm -hmm. because he saw it as a barrier to um, his, his, the, the goals of the party. Since then, Confucianism has come back despite mm -hmm. a long um uh, a long uh period of hostility to it uh the red guards famously destroyed the tomb of confucius and and um you know kill, a lot of confucian scholars were killed mao was very proud of that uh but it's back and uh the cult of mao is not um the uh chinese state allowed it to take hold to redevelop despite official communism and atheist materialism and so on and um it was only under xi jinping that it was officially recognized as a proper uh pro as a meritorious thing to do to sort of encourage these public um reconstructions of, of shrines and and statues of confucius and restoration of of uh, various rituals and so forth something similar happened with buddhism i think xi jinping himself is a buddhist by background mm -hmm. um Taoism too but it's it's really you know confucius is really at the center of it but it hasn't been it, the the state has encouraged it to an extent but it was sort of um pushing at an open door because the popular it was a desire you know, for it yes it was impossible to resist now, I portray this as actually a pretty severe ideological challenge um, to the West and to the world. What is it about communist China and, and Xi Jinping thought and all, their, all of these horrible, objectionable things that we should all take a dim view of? What is it about those things that, that have allowed uh, the, this sort of reawakening to occur? What mm -hmm. do they see in it? Um, they they may not see anything in it. They may think that it, this is just a kind of inevitable thing that has got to be allowed uh, uh, because there's no alternative, or they may be wishing to co-opt it. I don't know, mm -hmm. a bit of both. But there is nothing comparable in, in the West. It is very hard, and I don't exactly know why it's hard, but it's very hard for any public figures in the West to say anything nice about any religious tradition or any kind of philosophical school or whatever without very careful parsing and right. and qualifications and very sort of measured statements and so forth um but if if confucianism can be publicly held up as the 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 origin of uh, or the sort of repository of Chinese civilization and a kind of touchstone for moral conduct and 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 sort of gentlemanly behavior and so forth. Why can't we do the same thing? Why is it such a a struggle to to sort of keep asserting these sort of quote unquote secular values without uh, being informed of their origin or even their original purpose? Um, it seems to me that if we keep doing what we're doing, we will eventually have a kind of completely disordered public morality that no one will understand, or that it will only subsist within, um, within, or the sorry, the the, the philosophical underpinning of it mm. will only subsist within Christian uh, communities, and nobody else will understand it. That, that strikes me as a problem. Yeah. So, basically if if china can do it why can't we now i'm not saying this because i like china i'm saying yeah. it, although you know there are things to admire i've been there you know lovely people but i think that the government is you know the government 
uh, is is ultimately bound to fail because although they can encourage this 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 sort of return to the past in a sense, they're they are also doing other things with uh, you know uh, sort of fomenting a kind of uh, vigorous Han nationalism and 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 uh, uh, social credit uh, pilot projects and so forth that I think would never really fly here and which may ultimately be rejected there too but the you know the the worst outcome of all this would be one where um not just the confucian classics but even our own western ones are more readily more more highly spoken of and valued somewhere else outside the west uh, mm -hmm. and i i think that that would be a uh, i think that that would be a, a huge failure on our part yes Wow. Well, so much there. And I, I very much appreciate you uh, taking the time today, uh, Michael. The book, again, folks, is In Defense of Civilization. The author is Michael Jackson Bonner. Michael, I want to thank you so much for taking the time today. Thanks. Thanks very much.